Hello, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, college sports fans across the nation and around the world. This is Tim May with the Tim May Podcast with my usual co-pilot, Austin Ward. Austin, wave at him, my man. You slipped in a new word in that intro this week. It must be a more wide-ranging conversation. Yeah, if you know that, people who listen to my podcast regularly, and believe it or not, there are a few thousand that do that. Uh, they know when I, they, that's a little tip that I'm talking about more than, than Ohio State football, college football. I'm talking about all kinds of sports. And I'm trying not to use the word uh or you know in this podcast also. We'll see how far I get with that. You remember my famous uh cup? Right. Remember that? It was a nice check for Ryan Day. Yeah, it was. Yeah, man. If you're, wow, why I agreed to do that, I have no idea. Actually, I came up with it myself, but that's another story. Bottom line is, Austin, Ohio State, uh, this week, as you and I, as people are listening to this, Ohio State has gotten back to the practice field for spring practice, which is a very uh, – this is one of those – one of those – every spring is key, but this is one of those key springs for Ohio State to get its defense uh, straight, to bring on some new guys on the offensive realm. Uh, there's one uh, right there. Uh, but the bottom line is, uh, you know, there, there are some jobs to be had there. You and I are going to get into that later in some other – uh, later uh, uh, podcast, but I wanted to pay tribute a little bit right here to uh, yet another Ohio State National Championship program. The women, the women's hockey team prevailed over Minnesota Duluth in a really exciting uh, championship game on, uh, on what was that, Sunday. And yeah. uh, in Penn State, of all places, they played a hockey championship game. But the bottom line is uh, they prevailed. I think it was at Penn State, wasn't it? Yeah, brought that trophy home with them and arrived back on campus last night around 10.30 or 11. Had some some people to celebrate with. and um, Yeah, it, we talked about this the last couple of weeks, the championship expectations um, that apply not just to the football program, but almost exclusively across every uh, single program in the athletic department for Ohio State. And, you know, they made an aggressive hire. They saw what worked at some other places and hope to duplicate that. Obviously, it must have done some strong recruiting of uh, one of the best, if not the best women's hockey player in the country and a trophy honoring the best program in the country. You yeah. can't do much better than that. Um, and so whether a ton of attention is on that or not, it seems like they, yeah, people in that Ohio State ice rink uh, the week before were pretty enthralled by what they saw live in that overtime game and uh, decent television audience over the weekend for that Frozen Four. A lot of acclaim for that program. A great hire, some great players, and a great accomplishment. And you you tip your hat to that. It's something else for Ohio State to be very proud of. Yeah, you know, I had a I had a I had a recently graduated uh, women's hockey player on my podcast. You know, last year, and we talked about that. Nadine Muzzerall, what what she's brought to the fore, and it's just like a get after it attitude. And like you said, but also, you know, you're as good as your players are. Really, when you get down to that, when you get down to the uh, to the to the national playoffs, et cetera, and boy, every time they were challenged on Sunday uh, by Minnesota Duluth, they stepped up and delivered, and it was it was was pretty it was pretty cool to watch. But it was also a sign of hey, this this program looks like it's here to stay, and I think you agree with me on that, right? I think Muzzerall, Coach Muzzerall, has built a hell of a program. Got something going, and and again, it's what we've talked about before. You know, when when Ohio State Ohio State's going to commit to all of its athletic teams and give them what they need to succeed, um, their coaches and their players. And they've got um, so much to offer in Columbus, especially in this name, image, and likeness era that, you know, there's there's been a lot of this research and, and Open Doors has posted this elsewhere. Yeah. The percentage of money, yes, football is always going to be number one, but a lot of these quote-unquote non-revenue sports for the schools, well, they're – there's a lot of opportunities in that, whether that's a niche fan base or whether that's opportunities to, you know, do camps and, and provide coaching or whatever. A lot of these sports like women's hockey, uh, tennis, golf have opportunities for these players to market themselves and make a decent amount of money. And that's always going to be the case for Columbus a lot more than a lot of their competition, especially in women's hockey. I wouldn't pretend to sit here and say that I know, all the rest of their competitors, but I know yeah. who they played on Sunday in the championship game. And one of those is going to have uh, a lot more opportunity around town and a larger population base and a much larger fan base. So 
Exactly. And once you get things right, and it certainly appears that they've got the right leader, uh, she's got a national championship now to her credit. Um, that's sustainable and probably for a long time to come. Yeah. You know, as I texted uh, Gene Smith afterwards, I said, nothing. There's nothing in the world that beats just consummate joy, you know. And you could see the way that team rejoiced, <laughs> what yeah. that championship meant to the coach, to the players. Even if Gene Smith, he gets down in there in the huddle afterwards. He's over there. He gets in the huddle afterwards and leads the cheer, you know, that, uh, wow, a national championship. And to watch them skate around the ice with that championship trophy, it's not exactly the Stanley Cup, you know, but uh, – but it's still a, a nice uh, piece of hardware to put up on the mantle. And like you right. talked about, I mean, you know, Gene takes a lot of shots from a lot of people. And you know, like I, you know, I've said many times, uh, commissioners and athletic directors seem to get booed more often than not. Uh, but the bottom line is he, he has delivered on a lot of the promises to the women's hockey program. And now they've delivered. And uh, it's kind of a wake up call probably for other programs, right? Within the university that, uh, you know, you've got the uh, wherewithal, to compete, to go for national championships, you know, go do it. Doesn't mean you're going to always win one. Doesn't mean you're going to always get to the finals, but uh, the wherewithal is there for you to parlay it. And, uh, you know, by the way, before I get into one little quick conversation about another team that seems to be still trying to find its stride, which you, you and I will talk about in that program, uh, my guest this week is Mike Michael Brewster, former Ohio State center, four-year starter beginning his uh, freshman year in 2008. Ended up starting 49 games at Ohio State, second most, I think, in history uh, at Ohio State. Uh, he's been beating around, went, you know, went to the uh, went to the NFL uh, as an undrafted free agent. Uh, ended up starting for the Jacksonville Jaguars back then in 2012, even though he's undrafted free agent. Uh, kind of beat around in, in the NFL, got injured, and finally stepped out of that and is, has been working his way up through the ranks of coaching to finally get – a full-time coaching job is as, as a tight ends coach at Tennessee State, the head coach of whom I had on a few weeks ago, Eddie George, <laughs> former Heisman Trophy winner at Ohio State. But it's it's a really interesting conversation about assistant coaches and them having to work their way up the ladder to get that shot, finally that full-time shot, which once you get that full-time assistant shot, it can take you places. But right now he's very happy being in a, a high-rise apartment uh, near downtown Nashville, working for Tennessee State. We'll get into that in a minute after after the conversation. But you, after my conversation with Michael, but you do feel good for a guy like that, right? A hundred percent. I mean, we've known you and I both for as long as we've known this. You can't even when the graduate assistant and analyst armies weren't as large as they were. You still weren't able to uh, coordinate a practice at certainly the Ohio State level or any real college football level without. Uh, ex- some help for those full-time assistant coaches and the head coach. You've got a ton of managers and uh, people running around with bags and, you know, uh, footballs and yard markers. And, and I remember just all the work that goes into that dating back to when I first started doing this and was around it in Wyoming. And at that level, what you're talking about with Brewster and someone who's starting at a lower level at the mountain West. uh, I mean, they still have to, you could have to earn up your spot as a GA at those spots just to have an opportunity to do that at a place like Ohio State. And that means that you're probably making about $13,000 and being asked to continue your education to earn your keep to be part of that. At least that was the case when with the people that I knew doing all that uh, labor of love at Wyoming. Yeah. Well, you know, it's changed a little bit where you've got some guys like Keenan Bailey who are, you know, starting in that role and has now been at Ohio state five, six years and is considered one of the key cogs in that and someone that they don't want to lose. It used to be, you'd only, you'd hope that after two years they'd be done and they'd find somewhere else to go. And it's not that way anymore as, as the staffs have grown larger. But the point is those opportunities are difficult to get. And then the work that you have to do once you get there is so much more (laughs) grinding and, and taxing and difficult. You find out if you're made for it, and that's in the end why you, if you can make it through that and you become a, a full-time assistant coach or a head coach down the road, you get you get paid back for that work that you put in down the road uh, yeah. pretty easily. Hey, we're going to come back and talk a little bit more about that, you know, after my uh, interview with Michael Brewster uh, and stay tuned for that. But just real quick, now keep this in a nutshell, okay? Because we, we hit on the men's basketball program a, a week ago pretty hard. Well, you did. I was neutral. I was Switzerland. 
No, I'm just joking. I don't think Switzerland is even neutral anymore, from what I can tell. Uh, but the bottom line is they got one win. And since then, they, they won one NCAA tournament game and got beaten the, uh, against Villanova. Damn good Villanova team, in my opinion. Uh, yeah. But, you know, I was sitting there watching that game, and then my wife was asking me. She was watching another room because uh, um, she tends – my wife has become a big-time sports fan of, of late. It's pretty funny. She cheers or whatever for teams she doesn't know, even for teams she knows. But yeah. she finally asked me after the game, she goes, you know, they really came back and made a game of it, but – why did they keep getting the ball poked out? You know, why did the ball keep getting knocked out? And I said, well, well, that's because for when they made their comeback, they, they understood that Villanova is one of the tightest covering defensive teams in the nation. And if you put the ball on the floor, they're probably going to get their hand on it and knock it out. And I said, they finally came to grips with that midway through the second half. And then they lost their, they lost that idea again and end up paying the price big time. And it's interesting how this program was really close to, I think, a major victory uh, on Sunday, but couldn't get it done, you know, at the end. And, you know, but like I said, where, where do we now where do we put this? Because Villanova, what, number two seed, if I'm not mistaken? I'm trying to remember. That's right. Uh, but, you know, there's no honor lost in losing to a number two seed or one of the, you know, one of the top four. But the flip side of it is there was a game, again, it could have been one that was lost in the in the in the late going, just What's your take? Uh, do, do, do you sense that things are on the right path with the men's basketball program at The Ohio State University? Uh, personally, no, I, I don't. And, and I've made this point several times, and I want to make it again. I want to be clear. The, the, his team, Chris Holtman's team, played incredibly hard. They played great defense in the opening round. They got that win that, you know, Vegas and others, uh, Loyola Chicago was a trendy – pick to win that game. They had yeah. to actually pull an upset, um, you know, to do so. Part of that was the uncertainty over Kyle Young and Zed Key, get all that. But they won that game. They got to play again, and they played for 40 minutes hard. They could have folded when they were down 15. They did not. And that tells you that the players really uh, enjoy uh, and, and want to play hard for Chris Holtman, that they did that. And that's a, a notch in the, pro, in the pro column for him, a plus – for what he's doing. Now, I think that he's a certainly someone that the players relate to and like and believe in, but that doesn't necessarily change the outcome of what happened. And it's – I've said this before. Gene Smith is not going to fire Chris Holtman this offseason. What happened on Sunday is not going to change that. My point was about what giving him a contract extension might mean for the expectations without – if you were willing to do that without even seeing what was going to happen in the NCAA tournament, which now forget about the national championship part or final four. I think there's now another piece of evidence here that you, that can't be ignored, which is how does this relate to your rival? And Michigan is going to its fifth straight sweet 16 and in Ohio state, if it won, would have got to play its rival and you get to settle that. We wouldn't even be having any of these conversations because Chris Holtman would have found the second weekend. He would have had a chance to beat them head to head. Michigan uh, would have been the rubber match from the regular season when, when they split and then go to the elite eight. And then everything is on the table. And you say you fully believe in Chris Holtman and put some ink on those on that paper and move on. Yeah. Uh, recruiting class coming in, whatever else. But that's not the case for this team. They he hasn't taken Ohio State to a sweet 16. They're falling behind their rival. You don't know what's going to happen with Malachi Branham. Everyone points to this recruiting class as the other reason that you wouldn't want to make a move, and I certainly understand that. But the flip side is how you know much easier it is to build a basketball roster than it is a football roster. And now more than ever in the transfer portal and the free, free transfer era and name, image, and likeness, it shouldn't be that difficult to put together a competitive roster the kind that Ohio State needs to go further. I'm, everyone wants to suggest that I, I stick to football. I, I mean, I've been around that sport for a long time, too, and I understand that it's not as difficult for Ohio State to achieve that as many people are making that out to be. Just because of the same stuff that we said about women's hockey, you know, that's also true for basketball, believe it or not, and probably uh, more so for Ohio State and the power of that brand. I don't want to talk about this for the full length of the podcast. And I said plenty about it last week. That's why I said, keep it in a nutshell, but go ahead. This is a, this and is a Brazil nut. Go ahead. But it's, 
but that's also the point like tim i mean it's yeah if no, that's a great no that's a great example of nadine muserall came in and took a program and is now taking it to the pinnacle you know yeah uh and like you said i like chris holtman you know but i do people have this idea that i'm pushing some sort oh, of yeah. agenda against him i yeah. like his personality the, the dealings i've had with him are great and like i said the players believe in him i'm I don't, I don't wish anyone to be fired from that situation. Yeah. I'm trying to assess the state of that program and what Gene Smith and Ohio State expect of it. And yeah. Expectations. Yeah. The, you're, what you're laying out for everyone is what the expectations are. And clearly the expectations have not been met. You know, I mean, and like you said, if you, if you just uh, in a microcosm compared them to the chief rival, as they say, the team up north, it is not, they have not measured up and, right. and, you know, forget about the big 10 and championships, just about with your class, with your closest rival, your biggest rival, they've not measured up. And like you said, they have not gotten to the sweet 16, which I don't think is a big ask, you know, I think I think so. being one of 16 teams left in a tournament, you know, that's no really even huge major achievement. And yet it sort of is, it's another step on the ladder, right? I mean, that's what you're getting to. And, by now, you should be making at least that step, those two steps, uh, to to the Sweet Sixteen. Uh, it should have been done over the last several years. Has not been done. Go ahead. I'm sorry. And that's the other part of this when you're weighing it. And I know that there's no easy answer. And I also understand if they don't want their expectations to be, you have to get to a Final Four or win a national championship. That's fine. People that are satisfied with Chris Holtman. And they want to see 20 wins and and one, you know, one win in the NCAA tournament, that's fine. I don't care if you feel that way. And I, I'm not going to convince you otherwise. I personally believe that the standard that I'm setting out here of being a sweet 16 team on an annual basis and competing for a Big Ten championship all year in and year out is not out of the question. And certainly Correct. Chris Holt is being paid at a level to do that. They're not. If you want to make this case that North Carolina and Duke and Kansas, you know, these blue blood basketball programs are playing a different game and that's their standard for success. That's fine. I, I completely understand. And you're, that's probably fair and right, but those teams aren't even in the big 10 and for Michigan, Wisconsin, Iowa, Michigan state, these, these programs are not recruiting elite one and duns on a year in year out basis. They're not competing against Kentucky for the same recruits and they're building programs in a different way. And all of those other programs that I mentioned put a pretty big emphasis on football as well. Yeah. Now Ohio state does that more than anybody else and the results follow, but there's nothing that's to me, to my mind, dissimilar about Ohio state and its rival Ohio state and Michigan state, certainly Iowa, Wisconsin. Like it's not as if, basketball has some outsized importance and they don't care about football there. That's not true. It's not true. Right. So those are the teams that they should be competing against in, in beating consistently. And that's not happening. Yeah. And if, and if you think that you just have to keep the recruiting class together because it's the best Chris Holtman has, well, if, if, if you made a move, I bet the next coach would be a pretty good recruiter. I bet even if he didn't keep together that entire class, he'd be able to, either flip some guys or go in the portal and maybe have some success or keep pieces that are already there and, and win some games the same way that Chris Holtman did when he took over for Thad Mata and got Kata Bates, Diop and Jay Sean Tate and won at the highest level that he has in his career so far. Yeah. Like that's the way it works. And if they lose Malachi Branham and you don't make a coaching change, well, next year you're talking about an excuse of, well, gosh, they're just really young freshmen, you know, had this great class and they got to play and don't have any veterans. Well, why is that? Chris Holtman has been here for five years. Yeah. There's no excuse from Thad Mata that that could still linger at this point. Right. But but but, but here's why here's why I think he, you know he definitely gets the next year is because now he's, well, he's going to get. Yeah, exactly. But now he's made it an attractive place. He's got this recruiting class. You understand? I mean, it's yeah. this is the fruition moment for for the program from an attraction standpoint. All the other pieces are in place. I mean, they have been. You know. Uh, and uh, 
Yeah, I mean, I think definitely uh, I'm curious about next season. I'm already curious about it and see where things are going to go. But uh, there is a standard set now. There has always been a standard set. You know, as you were talking there, I'm just thinking from 1995 on, 94, you know, it was the Black Sox scandal, as I called it, when Ohio State got uh, drilled at, uh, at, uh, at Penn State, but came right back in 95. And from 95 on, there's only been a handful – a handful, maybe count them on one hand, maybe count them on three or four fingers, when the Ohio State football program has not been in contention in some form or fashion for the national championship or being in that realm, you know, that is so difficult to pull off its nuts. And uh, basically they, they lead in, you know, if you look back to 95 and on, they've done it more than any other program, including Alabama. You know, right. before Nick Saban got there, it was almost a had become almost a, a joke to a certain extent compared to what it had been long ago. And right. it's just amazing how once you get the ball rolling, how things can keep perpetuating. And with basketball, even that, it takes some time. But like you just said, you can turn a basketball team around with one recruiting class. You can't do that I with was, football. Huh? I was won two games last year, and I know everyone saw what they did over the week. Yeah, two, two yeah. games. Yeah, yeah. Well, there you go. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we'll be back to talk about this about a year from now. <laughs> because most people want to talk about football, right. uh, at least Me I too. do, and especially on my podcast. But uh, let's get my uh, – Austin, let's get right to my interview with Michael Brewster, man. He was one of my favorite guys who ever played Iowa State. I know. I say that about everybody who comes on my podcast. But he and I talked all the time when he was a player. We, we've stayed in touch – since he left while he was a player at Jacksonville and, and then when he got banged up and still tried to make some teams and, and then when he got into this coaching thing and is trying to make it happen. And like I said, in the meantime, he, he earned his MBA uh, along the way. He's not just some fly by night football or nothing else, but uh, kind of guy, but he clearly has dedicated himself to becoming a football coach. Let's get to that conversation and you and I'll come back and talk about what just a tough road that is to take man to go from <clears throat> unknown coach to to a full-time job at a big-time university here's my inter- here's my conversation with michael brewster as promised you know i'm taking a little bit of a trip down memory lane but also into the future here on my special guest this week ladies and gentlemen i think you most ohio state fans remember this guy uh his name's michael brewster michael brewster welcome to the tim may podcast finally my man Thanks for having me, Tim. Super uh, excited to be here. I know you are, man. You're excited about a lot of things going on in your life right now. You just, uh, you know, recently was named an assistant coach, full-time assistant coach uh, by Eddie George at uh, Tennessee State. You know, this is going to seem like I'm doing a Tennessee State commercial infomercial every three or four weeks because I had Eddie on a few weeks ago just talking about the year that was, you know, his first year as a head coach, uh, et cetera, all the uh, the uh, joy and the pain and the whatever you want to call it, you go through uh, rebuilding a program or taking a program to the next level. He turns around and uh, we talked about you a little bit on that podcast. He turns around and hires Michael Brewster, which makes, I think, three former Buckeyes, three former Ohio State football players. You're always Buckeyes, but three former Ohio State football players on his staff, including Richard McNutt and Pepe Pearson. And I would think you're you're over the moon because you've been working at this for a, for a while now, trying to get a a break in college football coaching and uh, you spent some GA time like at Bowling Green and, uh, and uh, last year with the university of Cincinnati under Luke fickle, but uh, in Western Michigan too. And you did a little uh, stuff uh, with high schools before that, but you've got to be pretty much fired up about where you've ended up. Right. Oh man. I, I just, you know, sometimes the uh, stars align and things work out and it's been a, it's been a long road just to get, you know, one opportunity. Um, you know, I went four seasons uh, and support staff roles, GAing, uh, Western Michigan, then Bowling Green, then coming, you know, down to Cincinnati uh, under Coach Fickle, work with defense for a year, kind of shadowed uh, Marcus Freeman for the year with linebackers, saw how he does things, his process, um, then moved back to offense, work with tight ends and um, this past season. And then, uh, yeah, four seasons, no interviews. And all of a sudden, then I had two interviews. Um, and then, you know, yeah. Coach George was was able to hire me um, to coach to come coach the tight ends and uh, man just super excited it's great to be here in Nashville we just wrapped up our first week of spring practice so um, you know 
starting to get in the groove and um, getting to know the guys and they, you know, they're, they're seeing how, you know, my process goes um, on a day-to-day basis. And so, you know, I'm just, uh, I'm super excited and, and just can't, you know, even describe the feeling to finally get an opportunity. Michael though, man, you know, two years at Cincinnati, man, you guys saw the heights. I mean, that the, the experience of last season has to be, has to really, really resonate, right? I mean, wow. I mean, uh, you got to yeah. experience going to the college football playoff, but being part of this organization that got to the college football playoff, taking the first team ever, you know, from the non-Power 5 group to the playoffs, that, that's got to still give you a little bit of goosebumps, doesn't it, being part of that? For sure. It was uh, it was an incredible experience. I mean, like I said, two two seasons at Cincinnati, um, you know, getting to see how Coach Fick uh, runs his program, how he's built his program um, to see, you know, how hard those guys play. That That's the one thing I'll always talk about is the way he uh, has instilled, you know, this effort that they play with is just incredible. Um, and, you know, it, it, it was just really cool to be in the Cotton Bowl and and play against Alabama. You know, we came up short, but um, shoot, in two seasons, what we lost two games. Yeah. You know, and we're both to top five, top six opponents. So um, you know, it, it was a uh, it was an awesome time and took a, took a lot away um, and felt really prepared coming in uh, to Tennessee State for this role. Hey, give me an idea here, real quick. What? What is the what is the one thing that just still sticks with you that you learned under Coach Fickle? Obviously, let's go back in time a little bit. Let's get in the time machine. 2011, mm-hmm. you know, you're a returning All-American center at Ohio State, and then all hell breaks loose. You know, uh, Jim Trussell has to resign. Luke Fickle is named the interim head coach at Ohio State. You're you're a captain of that team. Uh but yet you you got to see Coach Fickle become a head coach for the first time. You know what I mean? Wow. And uh, and I would think some impression was made there that was positive with him because he ends up bringing you on, you know, in a in a GA style role uh, with right. his team the last the previous two years. But yeah, let's get back to that 2011 thing. What what did you just learn uh, just watching him deal with being a head coach for the first time? But also, what did you learn yourself from that season that you still carry with you about? perseverance, whatever it is you want, you know, you want to call it. Yeah. I mean, you know, that, that was obviously a really tough year. Um, a lot of people were put in tough positions, uh, including coach Fick and myself, um, wasn't the ending that you'd hope for. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, I think the main thing for me is, and I told coach Fick, this was look what you can do in 10 years In 10 years, you went from being, you know, a, a first time interim head coach to being coach of the year um, yeah. from many different, you know, award recognitions and yeah. all that stuff. So, um, you know, I, I just think the grit that he, he displays every day, you know, every morning he's in there working out um, every day, he's pushing the staff, the players, everybody. Um, so just to see, where he started and where he is now. And, you know, he got to mentor under two great coaches, um, Coach Tress and 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 learned a lot from Coach Meyer. So you yeah. kind of see he developed his own style, kind of, you know, taking little bits and pieces from each of them, um, which I could definitely see just being with him these last two seasons. And, um, you know, there's a lot of things that I learned under him that I'll continue to do myself. Um, and, and, again, I think the, the one thing is just – preaching playing hard and it's it's demanded and those guys that they really do and I, th- I think that's the that will always be the biggest thing I remember about Cincinnati is just how hard those guys play I can't say enough about that hey real quick before we move on what, what's your I don't know if regret's the right word you know probably mm-hmm. the 2011 team's probably not going to have a big reunion one of the, you know what I mean uh yeah. you know those kind of teams that the, the basically ended up uh, what six and seven after you lost right. to uh, Florida and the uh, Gator Bowl uh, yes. They only the first losing season since 1988 Ohio State. I'm not. I'm only bringing that up from a mm-hmm. historical reference. Yet, you yes. know, you you got in, in four years at Ohio State, you got to see a lot of things, man. <laughs> you know, you got to see the glory, the almost playing for a national championship. You know, all those kind of things. Being an All American uh, in 2010 yourself, projected as a high draft pick, mm-hmm. and after the 2010 year, but you came back for your senior year, and you know, you know. The, the whole team just sort of like uh, it wasn't a special – they ended up not being a special season, which I think hurt you 
and your draft stock. I don't know if you agree or not, but uh, y'all didn't try to figure out who the quarterback was going to be. You know what I'm talking about, right on down the line. And yes. you dealt with that, you know, as a player. But uh, mm-hmm. you personally, what did you what did you draw from that now that you uh, can lean on from a standpoint of things aren't are always going to be rosy, right? No doubt. I mean, you know, the first three years, um, I mean, let's just say the f- through four years, start, you know, started 49 consecutive games at center. Um, and by the way, the second f- most, I think, in Ohio State history. Uh, and, yeah. yeah. I, I would, I would like someone to fact check this, but I, I think that I'm the only person to start that many games uh, without red shirting consecutively. Now, you know, someone would have yeah. to fact that that's, that's neither here nor there. I am proud of the fact that I was able to do that play through injuries for my teammates and all those things. Um, but, you know, I taken away through, you know, what did I take away through that season being so difficult? Um, just keep swinging, you know, because, yeah. um, you know, my first three years, thing everything we touched turned to gold that that last year because of the circumstances things were really difficult um but just keep pushing forward then what went undrafted then started as a undrafted rookie free agent at a position i hadn't played since high school at uh playing guard jacksonville jaguars jacksonville jaguars yeah in jacksonville and then at the end of my second season in jacksonville um late december got my ankle broke. I got rolled up uh, from behind playing left guard and that, that altered my career moving forward. Um, From there, you know, ended up getting cut the next season to being a practice squad player in Miami to going to new Orleans, uh, tearing my quad tendon. Um, So, you know, in both instances, I I, I got to see, you know, the highs, the lows um, and everything in between, um, which then, you know, getting into coaching, I just, you know, it's such a connection business. It really is. And, and to get your first job, you know, it, it, you're really going to have to rely on people, you know, and a lot of my, my offensive guys like Daryl Hazel and coach stress and coach Bowman, you know, they were just getting out of coaching um, guys that would have been willing to hire me. So, you know, shoot, go in GA at Western Michigan, go in GA at Bowling Green, go do two years of support staff. And you're sitting there and you're like, man, I'm four seasons. I'm staring down five seasons of sitting in support staff and, I, I know a lot of ball and I can't get it. I can't get a job. And I'm not, I'm talking for a lot of people. It's, I'm not the only one. So, um, but again, I just kept swinging. I can't tell you, I'm the guy that went to the convention and put my uh, resume above all the urinals. I'm the guy that's called a million people for jobs. Um, So through it all, I think the good thing is my network has expanded. I mean, it's, you know, I yeah. say I've built, built a pipeline that, you know, someday I'll be able to, you know, take advantage of. Um, but again, I just kept swinging. And, you know, right when, you know, you think you're going into season five, you know, grateful to be at Cincinnati, but, you know, I want to be a full time coach. Um, so look, you know, kind of looking down the barrel at season five, like, man, another s- support staff season, you know, with all my experience and what I bring to the table. Um but all those times swinging when coach George got the job last year, you know, I was blowing his phone up and he said, look, when there's an opening, I'll call you. Um, and there was an opening. He called me. Um, I actually interviewed for offensive line and um, they went with a, a coach, coach Lewis that um, has been coaching for a number of years. And, you know, I, I was, I was bummed, but understood. And shoot, two weeks later, three weeks later, uh, the tight ends coach took a job uh, with the Bills and the interview went really well. And they called me back and did another small interview. And um, and then, you know, they thought I was the best fit and shoot, the rest will be history. But, you know, it's, um, you know, just keep swinging, because if you don't, I mean, if you give up, you'll never, you know, you don't know when that opportunity is going to come. But um, it was it was the right time. And. Glad it worked out, dude. You, dude, you put you put your you put your vital information above urinals at the coaches' yeah. convention. You, you not know that story? No, tell me this story. This is a. Uh, I mean, to it. go tell, just tell me the story, man. That's okay. unbelievable. So, this is like circa 2018. Um, the coaches' convention. It was in Charlotte um, in 2017. That was the year I was transitioning out completely hung up the cleats, yeah. uh, worked uh, coaching in high school football at Orangewood Christian in Orlando, which um, was for one of my my old high school coach at Edgewater. He was now at a smaller school, um, did that, knew I was trying to get a GA job, 
Couldn't couldn't find one. Didn't get that until uh, mid or late June of 2018. So I rolled right in the season at Western Michigan. Um, but uh, at the coaches convention, I didn't know what it was all about. I just I thought maybe I don't know what I thought. I didn't know anything. So I mean, if you don't know, how do you know? But yeah. I thought the schools would maybe like have their own areas and you could go around. Um, I know it sounds silly, but I had no idea. So I took a whole bunch of packets with resumes and all this stuff. And I get there and it's just a million people. And I'm like, man, what am I going to do with all these? I mean, I'm not just going to go hand them out to people. So I was like, well, I, I know all these coaches, what do they do every night? They go drink. So um, what do they have to do in the morning after they've been hydrated? They got to go to the bathroom. So um, I took, I got there real early to the uh, convention center and, and literally put my resume above every single urinal and bathroom. Um only got one call off it. Maybe I pissed more people off than anything. Pardon, uh, hey, pardon the expression. Go ahead now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I don't know. Maybe I pissed more people off than anything. I don't know. But um, shoot, I, you know, again, I was just taking another swing. Um, hey, who called you? Uh, it was a small, small school in uh, Texas um, about a GA job or something. I can't uh, remember exactly, but um, yeah. literally one one person. Now, it got, it got a little publicity, which – you know, that's always good. I'm known as yeah. the urinal guy now, but, um, yeah. yeah, it was a creative, it was a creative play. I don't know. It, uh, it was, it was worth it. So, but that just shows, that's just like, that's one of many things I've done to try to create opportunities. Um, but again, I, one thing I didn't touch on back to, um, things learning, you know, the ups and the downs, um, talking about going undrafted, being a high, um, you know, expected to be a, you know, a high draft pick maybe after my junior year coming back, which I would have done. I'll do a million times over. I would have come back. Um, now business wise. Yeah. You probably go. Uh, and I would encourage, I will always encourage guys to leave for the NFL if I believe that that's what's best for them. Um, but if yeah. I didn't, if I, if all that didn't happen, okay. If everything doesn't happen. Um, and if I don't go to Jacksonville, which I chose to go to Jacksonville, I could have picked essentially could have picked at that point. I was undrafted. A lot of teams wanted me to come. Um, but I went to Jacksonville because Andy Heck was the only coach that called me prior to the draft. So um, I said, well, shoot, like I'm going to go to Jacksonville. He's the only guy that called me. They had a 14. Uh, their center was like 13 years in. I was like, OK, you know, I can maybe I can make this work. So went there and um, played for Andy Heck and had to play guard, um, which, you know, if I was drafted to play center, more than likely would have probably just stayed in my role and played center, but I had to learn a new position and um, nothing to take away from coach Bowman. Cause I think coach Bowman, um, he, well, I don't think I know he taught me everything about seeing the game, um, playing center, uh, learn, knowing how to call the game, um, understanding all that stuff. Yeah. Um, but when it came to like guard technique and I, I believe Andy Heck is one of, if not the best offensive line coach, uh, in football. Um, so yep. I had, I had two great offensive line coaches back to back. Now, the only difference was, was Andy coach Heck was teaching me how to play guard, which I hadn't done. So, um, if all that doesn't happen, I don't, I don't ever, I never play under coach Heck. Um, and probably 75, 80% of what I teach now, um, I learned under him. There's also a guy named Ron Prince. He was the assistant line coach in Jacksonville at the time, the former K state head coach. Um, he also was a great um, guy in that room that I took a, you know, a lot away from. So, you know, I say all that to say this, that, you know, coaching is my bigger purpose for sure. There's no doubt about it. Um, and without that experience and um, not only being under coach Bowman, but being under coach Heck, you know, learning a new position, um, I wouldn't be where I am now um, to be able to, teach guys at the level I believe I can teach at. And, and not only that, but then being, and, you know, I look back just this past season at Cincinnati working under coach Denbrock and now as the offensive coordinator at LSU, um, you know, I got to spend a year, you know, seeing his process, working with the tight ends, everything he, you know, all his knowledge, which he he's extremely bright. Um, he was great to me. It was, it was great working under him. Um, I learned, I learned so much from him. So, you know, I, there's been some coaches I've been blessed that I've gotten to work and play under some great coaches. Um, yeah. and, you know, taking all those experiences away and, you know, I, I take, take the things I really like and make them my own. And, um, you know, and that's why I feel so prepared. And, and, and that shows this past week being, being at Tennessee state working with these guys. Um, 
and you know they they they've recognized I believe quickly that hey this guy's gonna be able to get us better and you know I, I tell them look I never ran a route um, so I'm not gonna overcoach the route running our route tree is pretty simple but uh, when it comes to blocking you know we're gonna be yeah. some ass kickers so yeah uh, you know so anyways long story short yeah well that's funny because uh, working for Coach Eddie George. They better be tight ends. Better be blocking. <laughs> you know what I mean. Oh, yeah. And uh, but that's the same way with Brian Day, man. I mean, that's the job number one, as you well know, the glorified tackle position of tight end. But uh, then past that, you know, get them into the pass routes. But yeah. you know, if Jackson Smith and Jigba's running free, you know, why do you throw to the yeah. tight end, right? As uh, <laughs> Jeremy Rucker yeah. found out, etc. But I wanted to yeah. ask you this: uh, that that that's what's intriguing to me is, you know, uh, Eddie George. Like I said, I had him on my podcast a few weeks ago, and he's he's fired up about your enthusiasm and also your knowledge of the game. And, mm-hmm. you know, and we didn't get into like the fact you're coaching tight ends, which you were never a tight end, but, you know, uh, Walt Harris coached defense, you know, for a while right. before he, be- before he became an offensive guy, which then in the mid nineties, when uh, Sean Cooper brought him in at Ohio state, he revolutionized or changed over the Ohio state offense, you know, into a passing big time passing attack. And so you don't necessarily have to grow up over here, to be able to do what's over here, but have you spent, I don't know, as you get a job as a tight ends coach, do you spend the next, uh, before you get started, do you just cram on, Hey, what, you know what I mean? More and more trying to learn about the position and what's, what's expected. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, you know, luckily, you know, coach Fick had put me under, uh, coach Denbrock specifically to work with tight ends. So, um, Without that experience, could have I still came in and coached tight ends? Absolutely. I would have figured yeah. it out. Now, having that year of experience, learning the passing concepts, learning, you know, the route tree, you know, proper way to do this and that, um, how to manage, um, you know, you have multiple tight ends. You got to be able to, you know, rotate them and understand all that stuff. And you got some, it's sometimes 11 personnel, you have one tight end, 12 personnel, two tight ends, 13 personnel, three tight ends in. So like just – understanding that whole process and all those things um you know i was just overly prepared now there's there's always going to be learning and new things and learning will never stop but um yeah i mean as far as like the route running and stuff i mean our route tree is pretty simple um and, you know really i always say there's th- tight ends have to excel in three phases blocking catching and route running so you know we make sure to work all those things now obviously our head coach will um there will be a heavy emphasis on the run game. Um, it's uh, important. And also, and also to run the ball is, is really how you dominate the game anyway. So, yeah. um, Toughness. You know, that, that, right, exactly. That's first and foremost. So, um, but yeah, no, as far as everything else, you know, I just, I, I, Coach Hazel actually prepped me a lot. He was actually – he lives in Cincinnati. His son, Kyle, plays at Dayton. Um, so, Coach Hazel was the receivers coach at Ohio State when I was there and, then, yeah. you know, went on to be Purdue head coach and all these things. Um, and he's one of my greatest mentors. Um, but we we talked a lot through uh, the last year. Um, I'd go to his house and talk a lot about route running and those things. Um so, yeah, so, you know, I'm just always taking things away from other guys, yeah. um, drills, whatever it may be. Um, but, yeah, no, we're just, uh, you know, day by day. We have practice tomorrow, um, be practice number four, and then our spring game, I believe, is April 9th. So, yeah. um, you know, every day I'm getting better. I'm getting in my groove more, um, you know, and, like, you know, I find myself giving my guys notes the same way Marcus Freeman would give his guy notes, his guys notes, um, you know, so literally – I take the best things I see from people and then I make them my own. So, you know, if I didn't work, uh, you know, mentor under Marcus for that first season in Cincinnati, I don't I never see his process. Um, And I liked his process. So something I took away. Yeah. Isn't it amazing though, what you've seen uh, just, Mm -hmm. just in the microcosm. So Luke Fickle just thrust into being a head coach, you know, Mm -hmm. one minute he's not the next minute he is at Ohio state, you know, Mm -hmm. things didn't work out for, many reasons that year but right. you saw him come back back bounce back whatever mm-hmm. but you like you said you work with Marcus Freeman Marcus right. Freeman is now the head coach yeah. at Notre Dame you know what yeah. I mean in a Crazy. in an instant yep. uh because he you know went up there and took that job as defensive coordinator and then boom next thing you know he's the head coach I mean in an instant guys lives can change just like you 
posting your resume over the urinal or at least your phone number, you know, you never know what's, what's going to happen next. Right. And, uh, uh, but here you are, you know, you're working for Eddie George second year, going to be the second year head coach at Tennessee state, but he's an icon, you know, uh, he's a Heisman trophy winner. I mean, he's been a, as I called him, he's a thespian, you know, he's a registered thespian. I mean, uh, an actor, uh, et cetera. This guy's done all kinds of almost, you know, cosmopolitan man. And now you're working for him. And, uh, uh, and I'm just wondering, is, is that in its own right, kind of like crazy to you that this guy that was, you know, doing Hamlet or something, you know, three or four years ago, is now your boss, your head coach. I mean, his life has changed dramatically. Like he said, he went from the back of the line to the front of the line without going through the rest of the line, you know? And uh, just how crazy is all that in your mind, man? Yeah, no, it's uh, it's pretty surreal at first. I think I'm starting to settle in and, you know, it's, it's you know, he's extremely bright, extremely intelligent. Oh, yeah. Um, man of his word. I mean, he said he – and like I said, he didn't just give me this job, but I got turned down for the first one, which – you know, is what it is. Um, and I told them right after, like, look, I'll work for you guys any day of the week. Um, and you know, three weeks later, they call me back. So, um, he's a man of his word, um, integrity. Um, I mean, just a, just a great person. And just, like I said, ext- I mean, he went to Kellogg, he's, he's been on Broadway. Um, I mean, he does everything. It's incredible. And, you know, it's, and it's cool when I'm sitting, um, watching film with him on Thursday or Friday, and, you know, he he's asking my opinion on things that, you know, we want to do moving forward. And it's like it, it's pretty cool. So, yeah, um, you know, I, 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 I love it here. I've only been here a week and man, I just I can't say enough good things. And they're, they're the program is just coming up on its first year anniversary, you could say. Um, and the things he's been able to do and get done for these guys um, is pretty incredible. Um, the other crazy thing to me is, is that uh, and I've forget his name, but the owner of, uh, or the founder, I believe of Under Armour was his, uh, roommate. And, um, I think they went to Fork Union or something, uh, before Ohio state roommate. And, um, and that's why we're, you know, all Under Armoured out now. And he just got a new, uh, locker room. Um, I mean, the things he's done since, they've gotten here it is pretty amazing. I don't know how he does it or, or where he gets, finds the uh, donations and all this, but um, you he's, know, a business, he's a, a, he's a businessman on top of everything else. I mean, he knows how to network. He knows, you know, like you were talking about, you know, the building that network is crazy. What it, how it can pay off for you. You don't even know, you know, that this is going to pay off for you 10 years from now. Some guy you ran into, you know, right. uh, while you're walking the streets of Nashville or something, trying to, you know, become familiar with your new, you know, you never know who's going to walk back into your life, I guess. And that's, that's what's cool about Eddie. Cause you know, he's pressing buttons, man. He's not yeah. like, like, like he and I were talking about uh, the, you know, third and three calls on a Saturday afternoon. That's so much of a micro, just a micro piece of what being a head coach is, you know, or even being a coach like yourself. I mean, it's uh it's crazy what you do just for those 11 or 12 week, you know, uh, Saturdays. Right. I mean, just to get to coach a little bit of football. Right. Yeah, no doubt. And, you know, you know, being a, you know, I, I don't know, cause I have not been in that position, but being a head coach, you just, you're constantly doing so many other things than football. You, you really are just managing the whole program and um, everything that comes with it. So, you yeah. know, my, my job is easy compared to his, um, but again, the things that he's been able to get done for this program and not even a year. I mean, it, it's incredible because I only, you know, when they first got there, let's just say things weren't exactly um, in tip top shape or, um, you know, everybody in alignment on things and what they've been able to do. Again, it's incredible. Um, you know, they, they were in two separate locker rooms um, just based on, you know, what the situation was. So that was one, of the, you know, now they're all in one locker room, brand new locker room. Um just, just everything, they're starting to get that first-class experience. And um, I'm sure Coach George would tell you this as well, like college football, being a head coach, you know, it's much different than anything NFL-wise. So, you know, with the recruiting everything. So I know, you know, he's, you know, he's constantly still learning and um, adapting and, um, you know, he's doing a great job at it. And, uh, yeah, you know. Uh, do, you, do you feel like he's – you feel like he sort of stuck his neck out for you. I mean, when a guy gives you a break, what you as do you, do you feel like he sort of stuck his neck out for you? Now you want to pay back, so to speak. I mean, what is that? 
what is that sense of loyalty, et cetera? I mean, I'll be forever grateful. Um, not only did he stick his neck out for me, um, but the offensive coordinator, uh, a guy named Theron Age, Coach Age, he, uh, he this is, he's, he's brand new here. Um, he was hired in January, um, and we got to know each other through the process of the first interview. Um, and he was he also stuck his neck out there for me. Um, he was like, "Dude, you're a, you're you're a star." Um, you just haven't had an opportunity. And so look, every day I see him, I'm grateful as well. Cause you know, yeah, his, his input is, I mean, coach George is going to make the final decision on who he hires, but the coordinator's input is extremely important. So they both stuck their necks out there for me. Um, so every, I mean, every day I'm, I'm never having a bad day. Yeah, I mean, I'm doing what I love Get you know, getting to grow. I mean, there was no more growth opportunity for me in a support role there just wasn't um just based on you know my life's work of experience with ball i needed to be in control of guys um to teach them to you know build my plans for them day to day so yeah no i'm super grateful forever loyal um and you know yeah. it's speechless you know what i mean yeah i know exactly what you mean let me ask you this something you won't be speechless on huh? you get a job like this <laughs> you get handed a playbook i mean as a coach do you, I mean, who who teaches you before you teach the players? Mm-hmm. How does it work? Of you know, just in a just give it to me in a nutshell, so to speak. What kind of shell would have this nut? Uh, uh, how, how does it evolve from you getting that job to getting in lockstep with what they want their tight ends to do? So, ex- for example, and and b- becoming familiar with what they want their offense to do. How how does that work in like in a nutshell uh, way? Yeah. So, I mean, this, in a nutshell, this one was unique and crazy because um, the onboarding process, uh, they're trying to make it quicker, but it takes from the day you're really hired um, or offered the job, it takes like two to three weeks to get in the door. Um, So yeah, they got to check you out, right? (laughs) Yeah. 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 So like just getting all the paperwork and all that stuff, it just, it's a little slower for whatever reason. Um, Like I said, they're trying to, you know, speed that up moving forward, but it is what it is. So, you know, and we had a new offensive coordinator, um, new offensive line coach, then, you know, me, new tight ends coach. Um, So the coordinator didn't bring an entire playbook that he wanted to take bits and pieces from things in the past and kind of build it um, as we went. So, you know, there wasn't just an entire playbook I could be handed. I also didn't wasn't able to meet with my players leading up to spring ball because I was not officially hired yet. Um, and then they were on spring break the week before last. So um, literally walking in day one install one. So the playbook is broken up into installs. So you have 10 installs. Right? Every install has a little bit more for guys to digest. So, you know, they yeah. had already worked through install one a little bit and a little bit through install two the weeks leading up, but at the end of the day, I wasn't in there. They weren't hearing my language, my verbiage. Um, so to answer your question, it's uh, it's kind of fluid right now. Now we're not making up like everything is together. It's just it's a matter of tweaking it and, um, you know, making sure there's you know, things that aren't rule breakers or you know, on plays and all that. But, yeah, you, pretty much is day by day. Just install one, work them through that, give them notes, corrections, watch the film. They get, you know. I say I prescribe drills. I don't just run daily drills. I mean, there are everyday drills, you know, some people do. Um, Techniques. Yeah. But I have my basic drills that I like. Um, But at the end of the day, I'm I'm constantly watching the film, seeing what they're not doing well. And then I focus on those things. So if I need to make a new drill because they're struggling on backside cutoffs or whatever it might be, then I, I'm like a doctor. I prescribe them the drill and and that's what we work through that day in individual. So, um, but yeah, it, the process, like I said, it's been kind of fluid because just so many new faces on offense. I mean, we, we hadn't even met as an offensive staff until this week, you know, this past yeah. week. So, um, you know, we're starting to hit our stride a little bit and it'll continue to uh, evolve. It's interesting though. You as a player, I would think spring drills, about the third or fourth set you go through, you kind of go, Man, who needs that? I mean, I mean, I think any player, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you love spring drills uh, as a player, but as a coach, they are so precious, right? Those days, right. those two or three hour sessions, 
Maybe yeah. I don't know. FCS, do, do y'all get 15? I'm trying to remember. Um, I think you, I, yeah. I don't know. But anyway, uh, you know what I'm saying? I mean, they're so yeah. precious that that time you get to spend on the field with players, you know, actually teaching football, you know, right. in a team kind of grouping, mm-hmm. right? I mean, as a coach, you, you see how precious it is, right? It is. It is. And shoot, I only get what, 10 minutes of individual uh, work. So those 10 minutes are, I mean, it's, yeah, there's no water break in those 10 minutes. We got to roll because 10 minutes isn't very much. Cause you know, with at O-line when seven on sevens going on or this or that um, you know, you can get some extra individual work in or special teams, they can get extra individual work in, but you know, the tight ends are involved in every aspect. And, you know, that's why tight ends also unique because they probably have to know the most, um, after the quarterback, because they have, you know, they got to know the formations, the motions, the passing game, the run game. You know, there's a lot of yeah, um, exactly everything. So there's a lot on their plate protection, you know, so yeah. there's, a, there's a lot on their plate. Um, and that's why it's kind of unique. You got you got to really pick and choose, like, where am I focusing? How much do I want them to know? How much of the big picture do they need? You know, I don't want to overload them. Um, it's the same thing when I'm giving them pre-practice notes. Like, I can't put too much on here because they're kids. As, as a player, I'm not going to read it. If you give me three pages of notes, I'm not I'm not going to read every word. So try and just make it as condensed as possible and, you know, be player friendly because, shoot, I know how it is. Um, yeah. I'll always see myself as a player. So, um, you know, I just try to tailor their needs. Yeah. And you're only as effective as the as the least learned guy on your, you know, in your group. You know what I mean? I mean, yeah. you got to tailor it to, like you said, to where everybody can learn. Hey, last thing, Michael, I appreciate you, man. Uh, you got yourself a little apartment there up on a high rise and, and, uh, near, near the, you know, basically two miles from Tennessee state, kind of like down the street from, uh, Vanderbilt, uh, music row, the old music rows right down the road from you and stuff. Um, uh, do you have time? Do you have time as a, as a young, uh, still 32 year old, uh, coach to go out and have a little bit of a good time or get to know your neighborhood or are you just for the most part immersed in this great break you've gotten? Yeah, no, I mean, you know, first and foremost, always going to immerse myself and uh, make sure my guys have everything they need. And that's that's always my first concern. Um, but, you know, you know, when I get some time, especially in the off season, because season is just so busy, but in the off season, try and find time to kind of get out, see some stuff. I mean, such a great town. You can hear live music anywhere you want to go. Um, you know, like you said, I'm two minutes away from campus uh, or two miles, I should say, probably yeah. five, 10 minutes based on if I hit every light or not um, to get on, you know, the interstate real quick. But, you know, it, it, it's just a great place to be um, with a great program, a great, I mean, our coaching staff is is crazy. The guy, the, I mean, our D-line coach, um, Coach Clyde, he, he had like 120 sacks in the NFL. I mean, yeah. there's a lot of NFL um experience on our staff which, which is which is really cool not to mention um uh, coach pep and coach mcnutt um also being buckeyes so yeah you know, we we take a lot of grief you know in the building for the ohio state stuff because you know everybody likes to talk a little a little uh smack on that yeah but um but everyone's awesome but yeah it's it's just a great place to be all around and um you know you, you don't always get an opportunity to be in, in such a great city, especially in college, you know, NFL is always in a larger city, but in college, you know, you, a lot of times you can be in a small town or whatever. So just kind of definitely make sure my guys obviously um, have everything they need. And, and when I get some free time, definitely uh, enjoy myself and enjoy my surroundings. A little yeah. Bit. Plus, plus being a, a full-time coach now, you're, you got to have a recruiting duties. I mean, <laughs> you yes. know, that I'm sure you've kind of dealt with that in the past, but now it's like, you know, you're only really as good as the as the guys you bring in for the most part, right? I mean, uh, uh, do you do you feel fired up about that aspect of it? For sure, you know, and um, it, it's just crazy now because um, you know you have the portal, you got the the one time transfers, you get you got high school kids, so you know, yeah, some teams are. I mean, they're just getting guys from the portal and they're, they're kind of, you know, so it's going to be interesting as, as that, um, you know, moves forward, you know, is that going to hurt more high school kids, um, you know, opportunity wise, because, you know, schools can just kind of go in the portal. It's really free agency. I mean, it's, it's a form of professional football now is what it is. Yeah. I mean, like um, Coach George said when I had him on, you know, too, though, you don't just grab anybody in the portal either. I mean, you've right, got to, right. you got to do your due diligence on these guys. Well, why did you leave that other place? You know what I mean? All this kind of 
uh, stuff, but uh, a man yeah. in need is go ahead. No, I was just saying, yeah, and, and um, you know, from talking with Coach George, it, it doesn't sound like we, we're not going to be a program that's going to build a program off the portal. Right. Uh, now, like you said, sometimes you have needs. Um, you know, I'm, I need a tight end for the 2022 class, and I'm probably going to go that route, um, find a guy um, that has, you know, multiple years left. I think he's got three. Um, um, he's visiting in a few weeks. But, you know, sometimes you have needs. You can go to the portal. Guys can get a second chance. I think I think it serves a purpose. I think it's also great. It makes things a little crazy because – guys on your own team can transfer at any time right uh, so you know hey it is what it is you got to adapt you got to overcome you got to you know stay on the forefront of those things so and everyone's dealing with the same issues so um hey you got to get with it well whoever knew that putting your uh, your telephone number above a urinal at a coach's convention would even get any would get one phone call much less you know and you did get that it, but just you know, I think it proved to uh, Eddie George how serious you are, you know, not that he was at that convention, but that story, that anecdote, you know, I'm sure resonates all over uh, just how serious you are about this. This is not a whimsy. I mean, you've got your MBA, I think, uh, didn't you? You got you graduated yeah. from Ohio State in 2011. You got yeah. your MBA, I think, from the University of Indiana, if I'm not yeah, mistaken. Yeah. You yeah, know, was... you're a serious you're a serious dude. You're not just a, a leaf floating down a creek, right? No, yeah, no, I've. You know, I can't tell you how hard it was to get this first opportunity. Um, but I know I've said that a million times. I'll continue to say that. And I say that, too, for people that are going through the same things, like just keep swinging. But, yeah, so got my MBA from uh, the Kelly School at Indiana, which, you know, is uh, very well regarded. And the nice thing was the NFL paid for it. So um, not only did I get a, a great MBA, but, I, you know, I didn't pay a dime. Um I you didn't pay a dime for either one of your either one of your degrees. That's unbelievable. Of course, you played yeah. football, but you know, <laughs> gave up body parts. But uh, yeah, you no, broke an yeah. ankle and you broke a wrist, <laughs> yeah. and you you yeah. know, and exactly. you went through hell in 2011. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's true. Um, no, yeah, I lost my train of thought on that. But yeah, uh, but no, you were just talking about how. Mean, yeah, yeah, just so I essentially wanted my MBA and knew like through as I was GAing, I wanted to you know increase my value and knew that. You know, I mean, it's no it's no secret that college football is big, big, big business now. And, you know, to show people you have that business sense. And um, some people might say oh, that, is, that has nothing to do with football. But I mean, business has football has always been business to me. So, yeah. um, you know, my, my brother and my dad both being in the business world, Morgan Stanley. So, you know, that's it's just something I'm used to. And, you know, I'm not I'm not. I have no plans for that NBA outside of football. Um, I will never leave coaching. Um, people always, you know, oh, would you think about getting out of coaching and this and that? And like, nope, I'll like my, my opportunity will come. And when my opportunity comes, I'll do a great job and, um, you know, go from there. So, um, there but go. yeah, no, I'm a serious dude. And like you said, just took a million swings and just, you know, the million and first swing finally went through. So, um Home yeah, run. experience, yeah. yeah. Home run, grand by the, slam. By the way, you defense coordinator, Ohio State, Jim Knowles. You know, I went to Cornell, graduated. Well, went to the had a, went to a prestigious school there, and he, he ended up uh, on Wall Street after a little while, and then didn't like it. Got got back into coaching. You know what I mean? Because yeah. there's just something about it, man. Being around young people, being around the game, uh, that's different. You know, and if you're if you're good at it and you get the right breaks, you know, it's it's just great to be a part of, right? For sure. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think that one of the main reasons too why I would never get out is because um, in one of my classes actually at Indiana, you know, the teacher teacher said, you know, do what you can be the best in the world. at, And I think like there's nothing I can do better than teach guys hand to hand combat, essentially in the trenches. Yeah. Um, there's nothing I can do better than that. That's, I just was fortunate to play for some really good coaches and teachers and, you know, the way I learn and the way I make things my own. Um there's nothing I can be better at that. No CEO of any company. Yeah. There's nothing. Well, to be doing, yeah. So I agree. And by the way, I'm, I'm before we go, uh, I'm looking at the major, major situations there in football in, in uh, Nashville. You got Mike Vrabel, former Buckeye uh -huh. head coach of Tennessee Titans. You got Eddie George, uh, Heisman trophy winner at Ohio state, the head coach of Tennessee state. You got you, you mm -hmm. and, and pep and, uh, 
and Richard McNutt, who had that Heisman Trophy campaign. You don't remember that, but when he was at Ohio State. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> great guy, though, as you well know. Uh, yeah. I'm just wondering who the next head coach of Vanderbilt is going to be one of these days, man. Y'all could be the big triumvirate down there of Ohio State, ex-Ohio State folks. But, hey, Michael Brewster, thank you for joining me, man. If I could remember the name of this place, I, I've been sitting in a hotel and we've been talking. There's a great breakfast place right down the street from where, you, where your high-rise is there. I can't remember it to save my neck, but I will call you with it uh, later. Pancake but, pantry or something? What? Yeah. There's a place called the Pancake Pantry that yeah, everybody – that is it. Is it's, it? it's really good. Uh, there you everybody. go. Well, you are you already you know. See, I can't remember things. I I call my daughter my my one of my son's names and vice versa. You know what I mean? When you when you get older, things kind of slip. But Michael Brewster, you know how much uh, you you and I go back a long way, my man. And I've been yes, looking sir. forward to this for a while, and I'm I feel really good for you because I know how much effort you put into this. We've stayed in touch for a lot, yeah. the last several years as, you, as you've climbed this ladder. Maybe that ladder was more like a walking across a little bit more, more of a lateral thing uh, for a while there, but uh, congratulations, my man. And uh, we'll, we'll stay in touch. Okay. For sure. Thanks for having me, Tim. Always appreciate your uh, support, your friendship, known you for shoot, what, 14, 15 years now. Long time. Yeah. I really appreciate you having me on. And um, like I said, we got to get you down to Tennessee state and maybe you can hit us and you can hit uh, the Titans, and you can just do a big old Buckeye story. So there you go. I'll, uh, maybe I'll come down for that Nashville IndyCar race or something, man. We'll, we'll just make go. it a try, make it a triad. But uh, Michael <laughs> Brewster, thanks for joining me, my man. Thanks, Tim. Appreciate it. Yeah, Austin, you can you can tell by the excitement in Michael Brewster's voice, man. He is fired up. Yeah, he's at Tennessee State, an HBCU school, uh, FCS school. He's got a full time job as a as an assistant coach, as a tight ends coach. He played center. Uh, at Ohio State, was an All-American in 2010, 2011, the almost forgotten year, the uh, the interim year between Jim Trussell and Urban Meyer when Luke Fickle was tossed into a real tempest there and uh, did what he could do. But the bottom line is uh, Michael Brewster uh, has fought hard, long and hard, to get an, a full-time assistant coaching job in, in college football, and he's finally got one at Tennessee State. And by the way, that job, as you you know, as you heard in the interview there, they included at one point going to a coaches convention in Charlotte, not knowing even how a coaches convention works, <laughs> but just trying to spread his name, his resume, and posting his name and number. And while they watch people should call him, posting it over the urinals, you know, uh, outside the convention rooms, knowing at least one coach uh, or coaches would see it. They couldn't help but see it. And he did get one call from it. He didn't get a job from it, but uh you know he's he's an interesting dude who has finally uh, is finally paid off for him this persistence and you know it's funny because uh, during this time he all, he was offered a job at another FCS school but one that doesn't give scholarships and they, they wanted him to come as the uh, full time offensive line coach and he didn't mention this on the uh, podcast but uh, they were going to pay him twelve thousand dollars a year you know Tennessee State I'm Figuring he's making anywhere from 55 to 75, somewhere in that realm. We didn't get into that, but that's pretty decent money still, you know, for an FCS school. But the main thing is he's got a full time job now. And the, the price a lot of these guys pay, both financially, but also uh, just emotionally, just trying to get their foot in the door is amazing. And we see it even at Ohio State, you know, graduate assistants, uh, quality control guys. Guys who are just either trying to get their name up or trying to trying to keep their name hot in, in the coaching profession, it's a tough grind for these guys, right? Well, yeah, and because there's such a there's a finite number of positions that you can fill, and until the NCAA, like, I guess I would sit here and say I don't really understand why the number was nine for so long and then ten. What the harm is if you can afford to pay more coaches? You should be allowed to. It's supposed to be for the benefit of the student athlete, right? Like, mm -hmm. what's better than getting more hands-on? You know the answer to your. You know the answer to your conundrum, though, because well, not everybody not can afford to have a fifteen-man staff. Yeah. <laughs> I'm talking about not everybody in the 130 Division One schools can afford to have a fifteen-man staff. Go ahead. But not every not uh, not everybody in those 130 are competing on the same footing as it is right now. So. That's Voting blocks. Go ahead. I, anyway, but because of that, because of the rule and the restrictions on the size of the coaching staff, 
to get those full-time spots is difficult. And you look at, I mean, some of the places that you coach, I mean, look at Jim Knowles path and where he started or Mike Yersich before, you know, he got here and the road, he in division two and, and lower the places that you, you cut your teeth and get good at it. Um, yeah. Some, some people are able to do it from the GA spot or an analyst position or quality control or whatever title they get. Some aren't, some take, you know, you have to find somewhere where you can learn how to do it. And if you're cut out to do it, you know, remember when Brian Hartline started, his path is not going to be duplicated by very many people. But the question wasn't, do you know football? Like, uh, you know, were you proven as a player? Like, yeah. Do you want to do it? The hours that it takes. Do you want to be a recruiter? Do you want to watch film all week? Do you want to spend 18 hours in the office? Now, to Ryan Day's credit, this staff doesn't spend nearly as much time in there as maybe the old one did. Uh, and they have a maybe a little bit better life balance, but it's still 24 seven that you're on call responsible for your unit and the future guys who might be in it. And it is not for everybody. Yeah. Brian Hart, I found that, that it was Rooster's going to, you know, clearly this is the life that he wants to chase and he's uh, dove in with both feet. And I respect the hell out of those guys that do it because they're often putting in the same number of hours or more that the GAs and control guys and analysts than the full-time coaches just to make sure that they can do their job and set them up for the success and that maybe one day they'll be elevated to that position. That's how a lot of jobs work. I know that, you know, football is not the only one and our profession has a lot, has some similarities as many others do too with paying your dues and getting to the top. But uh, man, there's, that funnel to get there in football is really difficult and yeah. upside it's, down. It's an upside down funnel. You're exactly right. right. It's like, you know, and in some ways it might be easier to get to the NFL than to get one of these full-time coaching jobs like in Ohio state. So yeah, well, I'll tell you that story watching the San Francisco 49ers game way back when, and they showed a shot of the, uh, of the coach's booth one night. It was a, it was a, one of those Monday night games and there's Bo Pelini sitting in the back of it. This is like, 25, 30 years ago, I'm going, that's so that's where Bo Pelini is now, you know? And now, you know, granted, his he's he's had an interesting career since then. Uh, sure but he's been a head coach a couple of places, you know, and uh, but no, you're you're exactly right. Uh uh, but it, like like Michael and I were talking about too, though, it's along the way, what kind of hookups, what kind of uh what kind of network do you develop? You know, that that has so much to do with where you end up. I mean, we saw uh uh, Ryan Day, you know, he played for offensive coordinator Chip Kelly at New Hampshire. Well, the next thing you know, he's in the NFL for a couple of seasons. They were probably forgettable years, you know, at Philadelphia and then San Francisco with Chip Kelly. But he had that hookup, which took him places. But that hookup also helped him get into some other places. And then here's Justin Fry, who had a hookup with Ryan Day. You know, these the hookups are as, are as important, meaning this guy knows because he worked with you before, he can trust you. You know, you, there's some loyalty there. There are all these kind of things that go in the machinations of putting together a, a staff and then getting your foot in the door. Right. I mean, it's just and we see it all the time at Ohio State guys coming and going, but guys sticking around like Keenan Bay, like you just talked about. This guy's been an invaluable part of, in my opinion, of the staff. You agree? He's been there for a long time. And, you know, it's it'd be hard to imagine them without him. It would. And. And when all these conversations were ongoing in December and January for Ryan Day, you know, obviously the big big picture assessment was defensive coordinator and Jim Knowles and then who you're going to fill out with the full-time staff. But there was a lot of time and energy spent on a situation like Keenan Bailey who had, I don't want to, I knew the numbers at one time and I don't want to spill them all, but at least three full-time job offers, and I think as many as five this offseason, that was coming off of a previous offseason where he was approached by an NFL team for a full-time spot. Yeah, He's very well known in the coaching circles because of the reputation he's built and the amount of work he's done at Ohio State in a variety of different roles. And because, of, like I mentioned this earlier on in the show, because of the way staff building has changed, and the amount of money that is dedicated to that, Ohio State was able to come to him and say, look, we think that you're an important part of this. You're not going to be able to maybe do this recruiting. You're not going to have this 
truly fancy full-time title or any of that, you're important. And you can go take down this. You can go be a position coach somewhere else. Now, nowadays, the pay would be probably similar to what he's going to make at Ohio State this year. Or we think that you have a bright enough future that you could be an offensive coordinator somewhere. Or we could groom you to be a head coach. And, and rather than just being in a position room with the quarterbacks or just in a position room with the wide receivers, as he has been throughout his Ohio State time, you know, maybe you're taking a, a, a more of a coordinator perspective and spending more time with Ryan Day instead of Brian Hartline or Corey Dennis. And yeah. that's one specific example. But, you know, that's that wasn't really the case uh, 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, he's not one of the ones anymore who's going to class and, and having to finish a master's degree and eating ramen every night. Now, there's plenty of those guys that are still on around Ohio State because of what that can mean down the road. But you know, when people talk about the, anal- the prevalence of the analysts and, and all that stuff, you look at Alabama and you know Bill O'Brien or Lane Kiffin and uh, or uh, you know, Steve Sarkeesian, wh- whoever these these big name guys that come in. And Ohio State's done that a little bit. They did that last year with Paul Rhodes. But to get to organize a practice and get through it, you know to be able to cut up film and study advanced opponents. And even to some extent now being allowed maybe to DM some recruits the way that they weren't used to before the importance of these guys just to get through the day to day has never been uh, greater. And, and, you know, that's why you brought this up for a good reason, I think. And if you've got the courage and work ethic to get through it, uh, I, it's a thankless job, and yes. we all get to reap the benefit when we see it on Saturdays in the fall, but it's 365 days of sacrifices to do it, and and I tip my hat to them for sure. Yeah, absolutely, and, the, you know, and people always ask me, you know, a lot of people ask me because money always, you know, is <laughs> at the forefront of everyone's thing and talking about what different assistant coaches are making now and stuff, and I just remember when, when assistant coaches, even at Ohio State, you know, I think Nick Saban probably made like 26 26- Maybe not. I made twenty six thousand way back in the early eighties, right. uh, before the midnight massacre or whatever you want to call that. You know, <laughs> after after the Navy uh, Liberty yeah. Bowl. Uh, but uh, but the bottom line is, you know, the jobs we're talking about. I'm talking about full time assistant coaches jobs. The ma- the vast majority of them are nowhere near what the places like Alabama, Ohio State, USC, uh, Texas. You know, the big time. Uh, Clemson, the big time, really big time programs pay. Most of these guys are making a decent living, probably six figures at many of the power five school or power five, probably for sure. But uh, many of the division one schools, but not what not the kind of money you think they're making. It's just the creme de la creme jobs. I'm not say, necessarily saying everybody's got a creme de la creme job is a creme de la creme coach. You know, <laughs> you know, you, you and I both know that. Right. Yeah. Uh, but 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 I more power to them, you know, in, in that regard. Uh, and uh, but I guess what I'm getting to is just the the sacrifice that a lot of these guys go through just to get a shot. Them and their family, you know, the best the best thing I think you can do as a an aspiring coach is to be single, you know, so you could move from from here to there to yonder, just like Ryan Day. Look at his resume; he went back and forth the country a couple of times with his family before he landed at Ohio state and uh, has now set down roots, which is not why he wasn't, you know, everybody keeps, everybody keeps thinking for him. Like he's in a hurry to get out and go to an NFL job and become a, you know, you and I don't get that impression. I get the impression. He feels like he is building something, continuing to build on something big time at Ohio state. And uh, you know uh, it can really, it can really take him places from a legacy standpoint. And that's my little bit of a segue into, oh, my God, is it ever going to stop the stories about Urban Meyer and his uh, <laughs> nine months at Jacksonville? No, I don't think it will. And I don't think I don't think the athletic story, which, I mean, seems reasonably well reported to me, I don't think it really covered any new ground. I, yeah. I know that people are latching on to the Aaron Donald, you know, quote and – you and I both know that Urban Meyer knew who Aaron Donald was. Yeah, I'm not. Uh, that's the flashy one, and it's getting people to read it. And I don't, I, but I didn't see anything else about it that I, 
I didn't either already know or hadn't already been yeah. reported um, elsewhere. And I mean, as pa- there's a part of, I, I, I'm not, this is just a fact. Yeah. Urban Meyer is one of the most passionate recruiters and talent evaluators in the history of college football. Aaron Donald would not have been someone he didn't know who he was. Yeah. Even if he wasn't an elite recruit, he wouldn't have been unknown to him. And he's also more sarcastic and yes. um, potentially taken out of context. I, I don't know. I, I don't know the reporter. I don't know the source. I, I find it. I'm incredulous that he wouldn't have known who Aaron Donald was. And I don't believe that that would hold up to any sort of reality or scrutiny, but I mean, it, it helped uh, get people into a story. Not sure what the point of it was four months after he was fired. Um, How that helps anybody understand the situation in Jacksonville any better or understand urban Meyer with any more clarity uh, than they already had about Josh Lambeau or his inability to adjust from college to the NFL ranks. Like, I don't think it broke new ground, but maybe that's just me personally. And, and you and I obviously both know him better than uh, 99.9% of the world. So yeah. I guess, I guess that might shade our feelings on that, but. Yeah, but it I'm makes trying- me mad. It makes me mad a little bit that my, you know, that necessarily our dealings with him both in front of and behind the scenes that uh, we were misled, or they, you know, we we didn't know the real urban. I go, no, I know the real urban. Real urban is a toe up your butt uh, coaching style. That it basically, you know, Frederick Douglass, you know, agitate, agitate, agitate. That's his coaching style. He, yeah. you and I've talked about that many times on this on this podcast. And uh, you know, in college football, yeah, a lot of people you know, probably didn't appreciate that, you know, and understand, but, but, it, but the bottom line was uh, they got results from it. Uh, you know, he never, you know, there's no brutality that I can remember ever associated with urban Meyer and f- college football players at Ohio state. He was quite demanding. As we all know, he got the results uh, played for national championship was in contention almost every year at Ohio state that he was there probably every year when you really think about it, uh, yeah. was in the thinking about it. But, yeah, he had his own coaching style, just like everybody else does. Like Ryan Day is different from him. And uh, uh, But, you know, I don't know. Just people hold a grudge, and uh, the excuses are there for why things didn't get done. But, you, you know, it comes a time when you kind of got to look in the mirror and understand that, you know, even when he left Jacksonville, there wasn't no big flip flop, you know what I mean? There, when he was asked to politely leave, they had no flip flop on their season. They didn't get suddenly a lot better because they were, you know, the tyrant was out of the building. Uh, wow, you know the the general manager situation there is very interesting when you look at guys who turned out even uh, uh, even uh, interviewing for the head coaching job there because of the GM. You know, you just got to think there's a lot of things that are going on there that weren't. Part and parcel, Urban Meyer, but Urban Meyer was the. When you're a head college head coach, you're used to making a statement about "I want this," and it happening, you know, or somebody answering for it. Yes. In the NFL, as we all know, that is not necessarily the case, depending on uh, the program, right? I think Urban Meyer was still expecting people from Ohio State after he left to uh, still be on call for that sort of snap your fingers and you get it. I mean, that's the way you grow accustomed to that. And he had built uh, an empire for himself in college. You and I talked about this uh, at this time last year and for the draft and around the combine. I was never, I I think you were curious about it more than anything and that you weren't going to make any sort of judgment about it. I was skeptical about the transition. Yeah, you were. Start, And I didn't, think it was going to work and I would have loved to have seen it work that would have been pretty fun but I, more than anything I just wonder from the people that he talks to and gets advice from or communicates with regularly who told him that this was gonna this was a good idea or gonna work yeah because I know that 
I had multiple conversations with him the year he was out and doing the weekend kickoff shows at Urban's Pint House. And, uh, you know, the Texas job was in the mix. And I, he said from the start, and I, and I, that's why I was refuting it strongly that college football and name, image, and likeness and that stuff wasn't going to be a fit. And he didn't think his style was going to work there anymore. I guess the, the competitive side of him won out and that he decided to give the NFL a go. But yeah. I, I said, you've got a good thing going here. You get to vacation, you're doing TV, making a couple million dollars a year. You are, your coaching record uh, will go down forever as legendary at Ohio State. You don't need this. And I frankly don't think it suits. I, I, I can't imagine that your conversations with him were all that different. So I just want to know who told him that unless it was just his accountant, which that would be fine. I would understand that too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, the main thing I reinforced with him was that in the NFL, as opposed to college football, you know, if you go up and like pop the kicker with your toe, you know, five out of 10, what's a five out of 10. I don't even know, understand what that is, but you know what I'm talking about? You know, yeah. that's just your way of getting after him. But, uh, in pro football, a guy can take it the wrong way and file a complaint with an NFL PA, and the next thing you know, you know you're being uh, you're being brought up. You know you've got uh, all these assistant coaches. They have they have agents. They're talking to their agents. You know that's how stuff gets quote leaked out about what a tyrant or whatever you are. When in fact you're just you're coaching just like you always have. And I'll never forget when I had him on my podcast, man, late June uh, before, he, you know, last year, before he started the job, he he was raving. I was, I was talking to him about how, you know, there, there are other people you have to answer to in the NFL that, you know, complaints can come from a lot of different places. And he talked about how they had just had their this great round week of OTAs, right? Just he was fired up about the OTA the next week. He gets a hundred thousand dollar fine because they were a little too whatever it was physical or whatever it was in the OTAs, and I'm just going, oh my goodness, it's happening. You know, yeah. it's happening just like we thought it would, because yeah. you got to think there were some players there going, yeah, somebody needs to kick some butts around here, and then you got to think there were the other ones, the ones who get on Twitter, you know, like the same people get on Twitter and complain. There were other ones who were complaining behind the scenes. There were coaches there who weren't, who didn't do their homework on Urban Meyer. Uh, but Chris Ash was there with him. Charlie Strong, I think, was with him. Uh, uh, Anthony Schlegel was with him. They know what Urban Meyer is all about. You know, they probably understood it. I had, you know, we talked to Tim Walton. Tim Walton, you know, didn't have any major complaints about Urban Meyer. He's now, obviously, Tim Walton's now coaching on the Ohio State staff, but he was at Jacksonville last year. But, those aren't the only guys on the staff, you know, and uh, it only takes a few. I'm not saying that Urban didn't rub people the wrong way, because I guarantee you he did, yeah. and he did it on purpose, you know. <laughs> That's the safest bet you've ever made. Yeah, but uh, wow, you know, what's that old term, man up, right? But anyway, yeah. I mean, and I, I, think I digress. I'm sorry. They, you know, Jacksonville probably needed some of that, but – when, when Urban Meyer does that in 2012 in Columbus and you have Zach Bourne and John Simon outdoors, you know, for workouts and take their logos away and don't let them use the locker room. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's different than – and, well, it was different then. I guess I should say that because the situation is not the exact same now as he, Urban Meyer, referenced and, and knew himself um, – in 2020 when all this was coming uh, as a possibility with Texas or USC, which neither of those things were ever likely to yeah. happen. But, you know, the situation for all of sports has changed and that sort of Bear Bryant, Urban Meyer, you know, Bobby Knight approach doesn't, doesn't work. And yeah. Earl Bruce coached like that, for example, you know, yeah. I mean, for good, yeah. for good reason, you're yeah. not allowed to do that. Yeah. And yeah, and I know that it, it's, it's uh, we all sit up and, and even from different generations say, well, this is what we went through. And, you know, it sounds like, uh, you know, uphill both ways or get off my lawn, all that sort of stuff. But, you know, the, the, the times have changed and I, I think that it's fine. But the point is that at the NFL level, they were already at that stage where the players 
we're empowered and making millions of dollars and you know have the ability to move or or reveal what's going on behind the scenes in a way that college players didn't used to have and you know they probably needed some of the the culture changing toughness that Urban Meyer brought in and I've talked to to Schlegs about this with what they did with their their strength program and they had a lot of success with it yeah uh, he'll he'll be back um I think pretty soon on some Columbus airwaves and can talk about this more in depth. But I think something I talked to him about a few weeks ago was like they were, or they were proud of, was they were like number 31 in the league before they got there in soft tissue injury. And last year they were fifth. Yeah. Like they made changes with the strength program and, and, you know, behind the scenes stuff that were, that were working and they needed some of that. Now it didn't, it didn't entirely mesh because uh, of the situation at the top and it being professional athletes, but some of that was probably necessary and, you know, there were just it didn't work in a way that I thought it, it might not where wires got crossed and, and he tried too hard to make it college football and the NFL just isn't that. And yeah. it never will be. Yeah. It's interesting. You know, just when you, just when you guys call, just when we got, you guys call it a business, we call it a game. And when <laughs> we call it a business, you know, you call it a game. You know, uh, John Matuzak line, you know, from uh, North Dallas 40 still resonates. Uh, it's interesting now, but uh, like more people have power than ever to complain when things aren't cushy for them anymore. And, uh, you know, I guarantee you that was the first things Urban Meyer kicked out of the uh, facility were cushions. <laughs> but uh, but anyway, hey, we'll be back next week to talk about Ohio State football again. Uh, you and I are going to get to watch at least part of a practice, I think, again this week. Um, uh in the interim, I'll turn go from 67 to 68 years old, the day of which kept a secret. Uh, so I'll be a little bit wiser. We're to, how are we supposed to get a, a birthday party if we don't know what no, You don't celebrate after you get to be about 50, man. You'll find that out. Uh, Liberty will probably keep bringing it up to you, though. But uh, but the bottom line is I'll be a little bit wiser than I was a, a, uh, a week ago because I'll have the credentials there to prove it. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, I'm really looking forward – to really kind of getting into like the, the meat of the Ohio State spring drills, because this is a very important time for Ohio State, the, the restructuring of the defense, uh, who's going to step up on that offensive line to provide depth. I think they've got, like you and I talked about, they've got uh, they've got a starting five. I think they can side with anybody, go against anybody. We'll see where the depth comes from there. Some guys need to step up this spring. And, of course, you know, the wide receiver room, we've talked about that in depth, pardon the pun, uh, but, you know, just – or is, you know, or is Jaden Ballard going to really step up and become a factor in there with those other guys we've talked about so uh, prolifically over the last several weeks? But, you know, I know you're with me on that. I mean, uh, spring football, boy, you just wish you could watch every practice, don't you? I mean, I do. I, I've had this conversation with Jerry Emick numerous times, and I've been at places where you get to watch every practice. Yeah. And, uh, that's why I say that these GAs and I see them doing that work every day and I get worn out and exhausted just from watching every single day. I don't know if I could do it. I guess that makes me too soft for it, but yeah, uh, I would like I, to see, I would like to see uh, a handful of practices in their entire duration more than I would like to be there every single day for 20 minutes. I, that's what I'm my point, my point is, I'd like to see them when they're practicing real football. Well, instead of stretching I, hey, and loosening up, you and I, I'm sure that we can make that happen. Yeah, well, you know what I'm saying because that's where you really, I mean, if you pay attention, you can see guys that are doing, they're going this way and going that way, you know, in yeah. a relative sense. And yeah. uh, it's yeah. interesting. I have to, I used to get to watch every minute of every practice when Earl was there, when John Cooper was there, with a few exceptions, you know, but then things started getting closed off near the end of the John Cooper thing. And, you know, I, I really miss it because, you know, you, you get to know a lot of people, you know, not just the football players. And, uh, but you really get to know the football players. And, and that's what I miss, you know, I mean, I would still be doing, I know I'm going to be 68 years old here really quickly, but uh, I miss that, you know, because that was the fun part, in my opinion, of the job was getting to know guys. Yeah. And, I mean, that really helped uh, certainly yeah. when I started and it was that way uh, at Wyoming. And even uh, you know, I'd go, I didn't go every day because I was commuting back and forth with, from between Casper and, and Laramie. And, you know, I'd make sure that I was at two of them a week and they would practice in or Memorial stadium. 
Um, didn't have and obviously the situation was a little different than Ohio State, but you know, talking to the trainers and the medical staff who don't always have that much to do until something goes haywire out there, just shooting the breeze and yeah. things that they know and the situations people are dealing with. I mean, yeah, I know that this. I, I'm I'm going to say with 100 percent certainty that back when you were at Earl's and and John Cooper's practices, that you didn't need to ask the head coach for the availability report because you got it directly from the trainer who you talk to every single day. I talk to uh, Billy Hill sometimes 30, 30 minutes to an hour. We would just shoot the bull and we'd all, you know, you know, and it was no secrets. You know what I mean? It was like about who was banged up, but mainly we just shot the bull about fishing and other things. <laughs> yeah. For 29 minutes. And then for one minute you thought, okay, well, yeah. it's going to be exactly four weeks until this yeah. white who's going to be back. And then, yeah, you, um, yeah that was, and I, I used to quote them by name because they didn't care. So yeah, I did uh, too. I mean, Earl didn't care and neither did, uh, neither did, uh, neither did John Cooper. I mean, you know, you know, people can knock John Cooper all they want, you know, I, I don't care. I mean, there, yeah, there was, there was a time they, when it came to grabbing the brass ring, they fell short, you know, without a doubt, but they were at least grabbing for the brass ring. You know, they had a shot at the brass ring, but, the, but the working relationship and you and I both know me mm -hmm. I really like Ryan Day. You know, I, I like him a lot. I just think he is almost a consummate kind of almost everyday kind of fella who also happens to be the head coach at Ohio State and understands his role there and what that entails and everything can't be public purview, et cetera. But, you know, you can have conversations with him. But you and I had conversations with Urban Meyer too, you know, on a real kind of basis. And you just kind of, you kind of miss being able to do that every day, I guess, is my point. But yeah. that's just me, an old man, you know, well, not complaining, but we're sending soup back at the deli. Go ahead. I'm sorry. It feels kind of crazy for me that I'm at that point, too, where I can reminisce about that and and uh, what it used to be like to cover the team and, and how much easier maybe it would have been for, for people in our shoes, um, certainly now. But I understand why it's different. I do, too. Uh, I was day. the only guy there, usually me and uh, Dom Tiberi and Paul Spahn. And occasionally, uh, you know, when Bruce Hooley showed up, he would be there. But uh, finally, but uh, but uh, but there yeah, there weren't there, there weren't 30 dot com sitting there or 30 or 40 reporters from five or six or eight dot com sitting there waiting to talk to him. I remember when dot com was a uh, was a dirty word, you know, at least around the dispatch. I don't know yeah. why that was never, never understood that attitude. You know, that's how you get left in the dust is when you think that's something completely different conversation. Yeah, but it, that's how you get left in the dust. When uh, you see a train go by, you know, and you're in your covered wagon, yeah, I won't laugh. That's, that's, that's a fad. Look how dangerous, look how dangerous that is. <laughs> they don't even have tracks everywhere. You know, well, you know what I'm talking about, but I digress. Hey, I'm Very getting, much Very getting much. carried away here. Uh, uh, thanks again for joining me, Austin, on this Tim May podcast. You're, you're quite the co-pilot, my man. We have some great conversations. I just hope, uh, you know, when this thing crashes, that black box, they never find it. You know what I'm saying? Because the conversation we had when we took our eye off the ball would be bad. But, uh, you know, until next week, for Austin Ward, this is Tim May. We'll see you then.